Good morning. Thank you all. Um, it's such a it's great to be here, um, despite the weather. And um, I'm a huge uh, fan of Ian. He's really led the field in um, making encryption easy to use and a standard thing that most people have on their phones. Who here has an encrypted messaging app on their phone? Signal, WhatsApp, all right, good, winning. So you have thank Ian for pioneering that field. Um, so I have spent, I'm just gonna tell you two seconds about me and then I'll launch into uh, my newsroom that I just launched this week. Um, I am, I grew up in Silicon Valley in the 80s. Uh, my parents moved there to be part of the personal computer revolution. They were super excited. At that time, computers had gone from the size of like, uh, you know, this podium to the size of maybe just the top half. <laughs> and it was a really exciting time. And I grew up in a world where um, I really thought there were two possible career paths. Hardware, software. <laughs> and um, I was definitely a software person. I went to University of Chicago, studied math. They don't let you study a major in computer science because they think of it as um, you know, a subsidiary. <laughs> and uh, I was going to go into the field, but I fell in love with journalism and um, ended up at the Wall Street Journal for 14 years and ProPublica for four years. And I found myself eventually in the position of being in the newsroom where I was really one of the only people who really knew how to use a computer and knew what programming was. And so, um, not that I can program anymore, it's been a long time. My last language was Lisp, um, which was a long time ago. <laughs> and I, um, but I ended up sort of accidentally becoming a reporter covering technology who knew a little bit more maybe than the other reporters covering technology. And so ultimately I, um, started writing almost exclusively about the issue that we call privacy um, in 2010. I launched a series at the Wall Street Journal called What They Know, which is hilarious because I would like to do a 10 year later, like what they know now, which is like everything. Back, back then I thought it was a lot. <laughs> um, and, um, and then moved slowly into um, a lot of work on algorithmic bias at ProPublica in the past few years. And in the end, I realized I just wanted to build a whole newsroom around this type of work. And it's not just the issue we call privacy, as Jen said, it's really much more about autonomy and um, how are we using data to automate decisions about um, ourselves. But I want to start, so that's just a little bit about who am I, why am I here. Um, so basically, this is a little bit of an apology because I wanted to talk about privacy, which is my favorite topic, but I'm really going to have to talk about the newsroom I launched this week because it's too exciting. <laughs> we just started publishing on Tuesday, and we have a lot of really interesting approaches to how we analyze data and how we use data. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I view the world we're living in of information overload and what role journalists have to play in that world. So I want to start with the idea that journalism really has been a world about narrative. And when I got into it, you know, it was all about what is the story um, and do you have a great anecdote and generally is it something that makes people feel sad or is tear jerking, right? But the thing is, nowadays, we're living in a sea of narratives. Um, I just put up a few little pictures of like the various narratives that I'm following in my Twitter feed at any given time. I don't actually even know why, right? But I'm like following this person who's dying of ALS, and I'm following the stories of protests that was a while back in Hong Kong. And you know, I'm, I'm following all these narratives sort of in real time. And so like my narrative um, need for narrative is actually kind of overflow, I'm overflowing with narratives at the moment. And I feel like the question that most of us have in this world of narratives is actually, how meaningful is this narrative? Is this just one off? Is this just one outlier? Um, and it's an interesting story? Or is it representative of a greater trend? And nothing, I think, speaks to that more than maybe climate change, right? Every single storm, the question is, is this because of climate change, or is it just a weird, aberrant, you know, uh, event, right? Like this year in New York, we've had no snow. And so, of course, it could just be a one-off year, or it could be the whole planet is warming, and this is yet another sign. And I think everyone is always grasping for when can you basically claim causation. And the same thing with every Nazi rally that we have in the U.S., you know, are these representative of a real trend, or is this just a weird outlier fringe thing? 
Um, and then I have the, one of these ads from the, that was posted by the Russian troll farm during the election. You know, similarly, we, we don't know whether those ads swung the election. Were they really meaningful or not? So we have all this data, but we're sort of, I think, in some ways, as a readers and audiences, we're struggling for meaning in the data that we're, we're flooding. And you can see that in sort of the constant attempts to have, I mean, first of all, the question headline is also a little bit of clickbait, but there's a definitely this idea that we're constantly seeking from journalism answers. Well, how real is the, is the stuff that we're seeing? And so one of the things that I feel is that in this world, journalism needs to adjust, and we need to change how we view our job. And so one of the ways that we can change, actually, is just simply through our own language, right? We have previously referred to our work as stories, which is more like narratives. I think we should talk more about findings. What can we say definitively is true or not true? Previously, we have talked in journalism about objectivity. As you may know, that has led to a lot of false equivalence where there's an idea that the, the, the evidence on both sides, for instance, about the climate are equally valid, but they're not. Right, one side has a lot more evidence. Um, and so objectivity, I think, has led us to false equivalence in many cases. I think a better way for us as journalists to approach our work is to just think of it in terms of what is our hypothesis? What is the, what is the question that the story is trying to answer, which is, are we, um, is the climate, you know, is the globe warming and is it as a result of human uh, behavior? Um, and then, in traditional journalism, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but there's always a paragraph called, to be sure. It says, to be sure, everything I, you just read may or may not be true. <laughs> um, and I think that um, as journalists, we deserve, we, readers deserve a little more specificity. And so I, I have urged our newsroom to, we, are, we do thing, we actually write a section called limitations. What are the limitations of the findings? Like, our sample size was too small. Um, it can only tell us this amount. The confidence interval is this. Um, whatever we can do to put some bounds around the truth. The truth, the truth is that the truth is always hard to grasp, right? It's always out there just beyond our grasp. But the more realistic we can be about what um, what the limitations of our findings are, I think the more that we can um, gain the trust of readers who really, I feel, are feeling, I think, largely a little bit overwhelmed and maybe burned by the media these days. Um, we have, um, at the markup, which um, I just launched this week, we have actually decided that our um, guiding principle is a scientific method. So. We, um, there's a guy in Philip Meyer who wrote a book in 1973, far ahead of his time, um, claiming that journalism should be guided by the social methods of social science. And um, his movement, I don't think, took off, but we are using it, the battered old copies of his 1973 book, um, as somewhat of a guide. And I think that he, his point was that a journalism based on scientific method leaves a trail where error can be detected and truth verified. And I think that is our goal in the markup is honestly to have reproducible results. We, we would like to have findings that other people can verify and find errors in if possible. Um, so I'm going to give an example of what does it mean to do journalism based on the scientific method. Um, this is a story that um, my team did at ProPublica a few years ago. So we um, had a hypothesis, which was um, there was a story we saw, I think it was a Politico, that said Trump's Mar-a-Lago is a haven for spies. So that's very intriguing, right? Because they're basically their point was there's no security there, so how hard is it for a spy to break into Mar-a-Lago and find out what's going on? So we decided, well, why don't we do the lowest hanging fruit? Let's go like, see how open their Wi-Fi networks are. <laughs> so, um, so we rented a boat. <laughs> and uh, that's a little Wi-Fi gun. I don't know if you can see it on the boat. Um, 
but we, uh, we scanned the networks from afar and we found that there were a lot of open ports and that it would have been really easy to hack into it. We didn't hack into it. We just observed that the doors were open. <laughs> we did not open the doors. Um, and so basically what this meant was we were able to have a finding, which is any half-decent hacker could break into Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> and so that's a very definitive statement, right? It's not a question, can spies break in? It's a declarative statement, right? And then, of course, there are limitations to our findings, which is, you know, who knows how hard it is to get close enough on a boat and, you know, et cetera. Maybe you would be detected, et cetera. But we, I felt like this was a good example of, like, what the scientific means to us in journalism. Because, truthfully, we're not actually scientists, right? <laughs> we're not, um, we aren't going under IRB review. We don't have a lab with beakers. Like, we are still going to be different than what truly the scientific method would mean in an academic setting. And so that's why we, I've actually come up with a name for it, because I don't want to get scientists mad at me, so we're calling it the markup method. <laughs> so um, it's basically like, you know, journalism with a little more rigor approaching the scientific method, but not at that same level. <laughs> and we talk about our, the elements of our work as building, building data sets, bulletproofing those data sets, and then showing our work. So I think I'll talk to you about how that worked for one story that we just published. It was our inaugural investigation on Tuesday. Um, and it was a story about an algorithm that affects a lot of people, which is um, the algorithm that all state car insurance uses to price how much you have to pay in premiums. So traditionally, car insurance is based on what um, how your driving risk, basically. They know how many accidents you've had and, you know, your age and et cetera. However, we found that Allstate actually had a secret piece of their algorithm that was not based on your risk, was based on whether they thought you would go shop around to other uh, car insurance companies for a better price. And if you weren't going to shop around, they were actually going to give you a higher price. So they were going to give you a penalty for not shopping around. So the way we did this investigation was we found the way we basically that we got a tip, meaning we stumbled on a insurance filing from Allstate that had um, different rating assignments for all 93,000 customers it had in Maryland, and we thought this is really weird. Why would you have a different price? Um, basically rating factor for each one of these people. This filing was 1,100 pages long. And um, so we decided to test what, whether certain groups of people were being impacted differently. So we literally just joined that data with the census data because it was based, it had the zip code um, of each uh, person and did some preliminary analysis to see are there certain groups that are getting more disadvantaged than others. Um, our preliminary analysis actually found that um, it wasn't really geography based at all. Um, we did a decision tree and we found that the, almost the most of the variation in the assignment of prices was based on your previous price you were paying. If you're paying $1,900 or more per six months, um, you got a 20% increase. And if you were paying less than that, you got a lower increase. And so essentially it was just a t it was a test for your willingness to pay high prices. So that was what I would call the building part of the data set. Then we went to bulletproofing. So this is a very unusual practice in journalism newsrooms, which is normally you would never share your work before publication. It's a bit legally risky to do that because, um, at least in the U.S., the laws are based around intent. And so if you are shown to have bad intent, it could work against you. So a lot of, most newsrooms, you never would share your work. But we actually do share our work um, beforehand and do sort of a a version of peer review. It's not really peer review because these aren't our peers, but we, we went to s statisticians and asked them to look at our analysis, and we went to insurance industry experts to help to look at our analysis and have them help guide us on whether we were doing the analysis correctly. So they advised, actually, that we should just do a simple regression, and so we did that. This is the incomprehensible scatter plot <laughs> that resulted. Um, but it resulted in the same finding, but they felt it was a more rigorous way to approach that question than the decision tree. 
And so um, we, we put both analyses in our, uh, in our methodology because we're not wedded to choosing one. We just want to show that we did it. Um, and then the most important part of bulletproofing is we, go, we do what we call adversarial review, which is we went and sent all of our data, our code, and our write-up to Allstate and said, tell us where we're wrong. You know, we would love to know if there's something wrong in this analysis because you, you know, they have the most incentive to find an error, right? Um, the statisticians have another job and they just want to look and see if it's a cool technique, but they may not dig into the data to see did we code a field wrong or whatever. So uh, we sent to Allstate. They just declined to, um, to answer any detailed questions and they didn't raise any issues about the statistical analysis. So, um, so then we decided, okay, we'll publish. So we published our story on Tuesday and we did it while, uh, with a lot of, um, of work accompanying it. So we had a um, several thousand word methodology that we published that was very um, statistical. We have our data and our code up on GitHub. And of course we have the actual story itself, the human readable version, <laughs> which is um, where we described um, this algorithm as a sucker's list that squeezed big spenders, more money out of big spenders than others. And so we, um, this is a very unusual way to publish. There's two different stories. There's sort of the technical story and then there's the more narrative story. Um, but we think this is a way to build trust with our readers. Um, we call it building trust in journalism one data set at a time. And we published another thing this week on uh, Gmail's treatment of political email. Uh, the TLDR on that is that all of Pete's emails are going into the inbox and all of Bernie and Warren's <laughs> emails are going into spam um, in a default Gmail inbox with no human intervention. So um, basically we feel that we want to build trust with readers by having this extremely rigorous approach. We also though want to build trust with readers by protecting their data. So we are extremely unusual in that we don't do any tracking. Um, my colleague Nabiha, who's the president of the markup, uh, has this great quote that we want to investigate the ecosystem of data exploitation and we don't think we can do it while shackled to it. So what that means is we actually don't do any tracking. Um, we don't expose readers to first party cookies, third party cookies, any sort of tracking beacons. We collect the minimum data possible and we never monetize that data. For the nerds in the room, what that means is we have no idea who's at our website at any given time. <laughs> we have no numbers. We have no Google Analytics. Uh, we have no IP logging. We have no cookies. Um, we, have, uh, we have an email newsletter. We had to work really hard. It took us months to find a provider who wouldn't put a secret tracking pixel in the newsletter to show when it's opened because that's a common industry practice to have a, what the open rates are on your newsletter, which means you track readers when they open it. Um, we are working, by the way, with um, the great Ian Goldberg to build a privacy protecting version of Google Analytics that will allow us to estimate our traffic. But at the current moment, we have no idea. Like we launched and we're like, Seems like people read it, I don't know, <laughs> right? We have no idea. We have, the, we have the logs, which is like just the page hits. So like back in the old days when there was like a hit counter on the page, that's all we know. As a result, by the way, our website is very fast. So um, <laughs> this is um, a, it take, I think this is showing that it was like less than a megabyte of uh, data downloaded for our big investigative story. Somebody tweeted out this and then showed that it was um, compared to the New York Times page for corrections would had no corrections on it with six megabytes. Um, and so we are extremely fast as a website. Um, so essentially, in some ways, the markup is itsel itself its own experiment. Um, we're experimenting with the hypothesis of whether our privacy promise will attract readers and donors. And we're experimenting with whether our data-driven approach will build trust and drive impact. And so we are, um, we're going to cross our fingers <laughs> and see that if this experiment works. Um, but I appreciate you listening, and I would love to open it up for questions. So I don't understand the difference between what you're doing and academic publishing. 
it seems like almost exactly the same thing. Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, it is different in the sense that we are uh, not doing peer review, we're not submitting to journals, um, we're not IRB reviewed in terms of the experiments that we do, um, and we just generally don't um, view ourselves as academics. We see ourselves as journalists who are using the most advanced computational tools um, to investigate the most important questions of our time. Um, and I think it's great, I, I just think it's worth having a model of a newsroom that does this type of computational work um, on behalf of the public. Because the truth is that academics have slightly different incentives. So a lot of academic institutions are not as interested in to be really candid, they're not really as interested in naming names <laughs> as we are, right? We're calling out Allstate and saying they have a suckers list, which I think is not exactly what most general counsels at universities are really psyched about. They would rather um, you just say, oh, I found a novel algorithm with an interesting take, but it's a it's slightly different lens. It's, a, it's speaking to other academics about an algorithm that you've analyzed, but not speaking to the public about how an algorithm is harming them. So I think we have a role to play, but I do feel that academics sometimes get annoyed at me for like treading on their territory, but I, I would just say imitation is the greatest sign of flattery, or what is it, <laughs> of respect? And so um, I hope you can see it in that way. Thank you, Julia. Um, I just have a question. I'm just curious, what is your business model if you're not tracking any of that data? Oh, yeah, we're a nonprofit newsroom um, entirely funded by philanthropy and donations. So I, I've seen that uh, you, you do not uh, track any user information. Uh, so, I mean, philosophically speaking, uh, how do you see this compromise between privacy and the need to advertise or to recommend user specific story based on their profile? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a big challenge right now. Um, yeah, so we're not going to be doing any personalized recommendations um, for people of, of reading what news they should read. We are going to hope that readers can find that themselves. Um, the truth is that advertising uh, did exist before everyone was being tracked every second, right? Um, billboards were on the highway for a reason to, um, because they just everyone who drove by would see it. And so we're going to be relying more on what we might call brand marketing, which is just sort of general billboards. We actually have a billboard right now at the entrance to um, Palo Alto from 101, which is sort of like, I would say, the heart of Silicon Valley. And it says, big tech is watching you. Who's watching big tech? The markup. And so we are actually going old school in our marketing. We have subway ads. Um, so we can reach people. We just, um, we just don't need to know all of their names and whether they clicked on something. Your background is in math, as was said for your introduction. Do you think it's necessary to, when reporting on big tech sort of things, have such a background? Do you require it from the people in your newsroom, or do you value it as an asset um, higher than something else, like a, an undergraduate degree in journalism? I don't know if such yep. things exist. That's such a good question. Um, no, I don't, really, um, I don't really think you have to have a math background. The only thing the math background has given me is the ability to not be scared by people who are trying to talk math at me to make me stop asking questions. Um, but it's not like I'm actually, I actually don't, I'm not an expert. I don't know exactly what that regression analysis, I can't do that myself. Our staff works with statisticians. We're, and that's actually something that's really important. So even though we want to bring a lot of expertise to our work, I think it's also really important for journalists to um, have a posture of not knowing. Right? That is really the, that is the scientific posture, which is like, I don't know. I'm testing this hypothesis. I may be wrong. And we often, we do discard investigations when our hypothesis is wrong because you have to be willing to fail in order to learn. And so I don't, um, I don't have a strong feeling about credentials. I do have a really strong feeling about that sense of inquiry and the willingness to go however far it takes to get to the bottom of something. So for instance, a lot of our, pro I don't think there's a single programmer. We have, our newsroom is half programmers, half traditional journalists, and um, none of them have CS degrees. I find that um, the, 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 the mentality that you need to be, what we, I would say is like a little bit more forensic in your analysis is not what has coming out of CS, and a lot of them are art majors or people in um, 
biological sciences. It's really um, been interesting to see what kind of fields. And then our, most of the journalists um, don't have a math background. They just are people who are interested in inquiring. Are there uh, any plans to use technology to develop the hypotheses for investigation, or will they be all based on human intuition as to what to investigate? Uh, technologies to... So like doing big data analytics to identify trends that may be outliers in the data set and yep. reverse engineer that data to find like you did with the... Yeah, so we do do quite a bit of that. We're um, often using machine learning is probably the main thing that we use to build classifiers because one of the things that journalists can do is collect a big amount of data and attempt to classify it in order to learn things. So one of the things that I did when I was at ProPublica was my team built something called the Facebook political ad collector. After the 2016 election, we realized that nobody knew what had happened on Facebook with ads, right? There was like this story about the Russians, there was a story about Cambridge Analytica, but there was no data. So I thought, we don't want to do, let's not have that happen again. So I built a browser extension where if you added it to your computer, um, when you were browsing Facebook, it would pull the ads from your feed, and then it would do a classification, whether they're political or not political, and put them in a public repository so that all the political ads could be seen. So essentially, it was a way for readers to donate their data, but only the political ads. So to do that, we had to build a political ad classifier, which meant we had to train a classifier on a huge corpus of political and non-political speech in order to build a classification system that would work. And then what we did is we had the users would help us train it, that we would, it would show up a little box. These are the ones we thought were political, are we correct? And they would help us, you know, um, basically refine our algorithm. So yes, we use big data analysis techniques uh, on behalf of the public. So this Can you seems, speak into it more? Yeah. Yeah. This seems like slow journalism that takes a lot of time. You have a lot of dead ends. You don't have a sort of, I need this by this afternoon stat. So can you give us an example of how long sort of an article might take in the markup method via uh, sort of the traditional uh, newsroom method? Oh, yeah. This is a... Yeah, this is um, very expensive and very slow work. Um, I, but that's not actually unusual for an investigative newsroom. So ProPublica, where I came from, was an investigative newsroom. And honestly, if you published one investigation a year, you were killing it, right? And that's probably what, uh, that will be probably true for the markup as well. Um, we aren't going to have a story every day. We're going to have a story... You know, we'll have big investigations every month or two, and we, but we're hiring a staff of daily reporters who will write m more often for the website because it does feel like you should have something on your website. <laughs> but, um, but ultimately, I have spoken to a lot of people in, um, in the investigative news business, and like um, the woman who runs Mother Jones told me, she said, you know, honestly, you make all of your money, if you're in a donation model business, you make all of your money from one great investigation. And so you publish literally once a year, it's still a good model for donations. And that's why nonprofit feels like the right model for our work, because we're definitely not a volume business, right? And the volume business is the clicks, 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 500 stories a day, and that tiny, tiny bit of ad revenue you get from exploiting your readers' data and attention. But we're going for a longer game, which is we're going to hope that one or two of these investigations really lands and honestly makes an impact. The reason people are donating to us is that they want to make change in the world. And I think, honestly, that when that data is how you make change in the world. Releasing a data set, is, it allows the story to then travel into policy circles. So the story that I did at ProPublica that is made the most impact in the world probably is the one where we analyzed a um, criminal risk score algorithm and showed that it was biased against black defendants. And these algorithms, and this one and similar ones, are used across the US in all stages of the criminal justice system. And that story, because we released the data set and our code, has hundreds and hundreds of academic citations, has helped build a field around fairness and transparency and machine learning, and has had a huge impact on the world. And that's the kind of thing we want to do. We want to put 
our work out there so that policymakers can make changes in how they do things. And honestly, these days, it's not as if it wasn't known before that asking people, the criminal risk score is like you get arrested, it come in, they ask you a bunch of questions like, is your neighborhood safe? Has your parents ever been arrested before? Um, you know, anyone in your family in jail, et cetera. It was always known that these were clearly just proxies for race and low income people. And yet, no one had proved it because no one had thrown math over the fence, right? And so essentially all we did was just put a data set over the fence and suddenly it opened up the debate in a way that even though it was philosophically known that these were obviously biased, we were able to change that debate. And so that's why we want to release the data is to give these stories a, another life where other people use them to advocate for change. I'm just wondering if you guys are going to accept... Uh Anonymous donations right now. Sorry, just can you uh, speak louder? Yeah. Will you accept uh, crypto cryptocurrencies for anonymous donations? Because right now I just see credit cards on your site. Yeah. Right now, we're, no, we're not doing cryptocurrencies. So for I, um, for both the standards of the IRS and for nonprofit status and for the standards of our industry, which is nonprofit newsroom ethical guidelines, you are um, supposed to ex um, reveal all your donors. And so we want to comply with that ultimate transparency. It's a trade-off, right? But we would like to be accountable to the fact, like if Jeff Bezos was to give us thousands of dollars and all of a sudden we were uh, writing positive stories about Amazon, we would want the public to know that. So that's more important to us than the ability to accept cryptocurrencies, sadly. Sorry. Okay. Let's thank thank you very much.